I have 12 o'clock, I have 12 o'clock noon, we will get started uh, with the October, believe it or not, October um, Swing Bed Education Program and working with Carrie Dunning, our Swing Bed Consultant for the State Office of Rural Health. Carrie's been working with us now for a couple of years and helping us learn how to build our programs, have a good solid uh, compliance in place and uh, plan for pre-COVID, post-COVID, during COVID, knowing the waivers and she's just been a great resource for us. Uh, before we get started today, just to go over some logistics, um, where we use the Zoom platform and would like for you to open up the chat function to watch chat. And also, if you have any questions, um, you can use the chat function or feel free to unmute your line. Open up the participant list by hovering at the bottom and clicking on participants, and then you can click the uh, unmute button beside your name and the participant list. Also, there is a mute unmute microphone button when you hover at the bottom as well. Would be great if uh, you could type in your name for attendance purposes. Not all names show up in the participant list and where you're from, or if there's more than one person in the room listening with you to let us know who's there. Uh, we do monitor and track attendance and also welcome any um, future topics that you would like to have discussed in more detail. Before we get started too, I'd like to announce that the State Office of Rural Health was able to put some money aside again to provide some swing bed certificates for um, some uh, critical access hospital swing bed staff um, at facilities. Last year, we did actually graduate 17 individuals with a swing bed certificate. And this year we will be able to provide 15 more. We will be sending out an announcement in the next couple of days. We're just shoring some things up. The certificate is provided by Hometown Health, but actually Carrie Dunning uh, provides the swing bed education through their certificate program. And it consists of six modules that um, Carrie steps through key components of swing bed compliance. At the end of each mod module, there is a quiz and evaluation that needs to be completed for each of the sessions to, in order to receive your certificate. The um, modules are about an hour in length and they will be on the fourth Monday of the month from two to three Eastern time or one to two central. Um, when we send out the announcements, we will list the dates for all six modules and webinar invitations will come from Hometown Health, which is a little different too. We will take the first 15 that I receive uh, a request for uh, attendance once it comes out. Uh, very grateful to the State Office of Rural Health for covering the cost. So if you do sign up for it, we would like for you to make every effort possible to complete the program as we do have to pay for each certificate. And sessions are recorded if you're unable to attend with the opportunity to complete the quiz and the evaluation. So be watching for that information coming out. So at this time, I will turn the, the uh, discussion over to Carrie Dunning. Her presentation for today was sent out this morning. Uh, if you'd like to open that up to reference and take notes. And Carrie, again, has worked with us for the past couple of years in developing swing bed programs. Carrie's very involved in providing technical assistance to rural hospitals across the country um, and providing the same type of education and has also worked internationally. So Carrie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. And as we were talking about before everybody got on, I I would take an international project now in a flash just to start <laughs> traveling again. So anyway, I want to, uh, I'm going to start, I have a topic for today that I want to get through, but I have a, a couple of things going on that I just want to give you some heads up on. And all of this happened this morning, or it would have been on a slide. Um, first of all, the federal government's putting out uh, nursing home data once a week directly related to COVID. 
And they had been reducing the amount of COVID cases in nursing homes um, up until about three weeks ago, just like much of the country, there's still hot spots. Uh, but considering I was in the hottest of the hot spots in Jacksonville, Florida, for about three months, and um, we're down to, uh, at one point, the hospital that I use, uh, St. Vincent's, which is part of the Ascension system, had over 200 uh, COVID admissions, and they're down to less than 20 uh, as of yesterday. So we're on that swing. But the data that came out of the, the um, national um, data on nursing homes has been going up for the last three weeks. And what was interesting is the data they um, uh, produced today showed uh, nearly an increase of 6,000 cases um, nationally and uh, over 600 deaths nationally in the one week. Uh, I'm just, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing that is directly related to your swing bed program, except I'm calling attention to the nursing homes seem to be having trouble again. That means you need to be very knowledgeable of the nursing homes in your immediate area because that's who you have to work with. Um, and you have to make some decisions. If they um, have COVID patients, you know, I think we've worked out relationships uh, during the last 19, 20 months. Um, but just just pay attention and make sure um, it may impact your discharges, um, you know, either from your hospital and or your swing bed at some point. So that's number one. Number two, the number of uh, things that are coming from CMS uh, this week and some of the chatter that other consultants are hearing, we think we're getting close to what they call an interim rule being released. The interim rule um, is, is a set of rules for any set. It could be for acute, it could be for outpatient therapy. Uh, this will be for long-term care and skilled nursing, which as you know, we fall under that. Um, they're usually hundreds of pages in length. Um, and the interesting thing is Two things. We're sort of caught up still in the waivers, so we've got to pay t attention to that to see if that's going to do anything to the waivers. It shouldn't be any earlier than what we've been told, but I don't take anything from granted, you know, when CMS is changing things. More importantly, it will lead um, to the evolution of the next MDS. Um, now, it won't happen immediately because this has to go through a process, and then there will be a time period where the, the MDS has to be uh, changed to meet the new rules. Um, and why is that important to those of you in critical access? That means, again, the MDS, I'm going to say over and over and over, is where we find Medicare intent and whatever they change uh, on the new MDS, add to, delete, we will be studying just so that you stay uh, up to date on that. So, again, the nursing homes seem to have a lot going on right now and that indirectly uh, will eventually uh, impact us. So, a heads up, pay attention to your guys in your immediate area. Now, I got very positive when I started on this topic. I'm actually doing this uh, for about six or seven states in different degrees right now, um, which is beginning to look at what we're going to do post-COVID. What is real life going to look like? Um, and I say post-COVID very carefully. Um, I'm of the belief this is going to be like flu. Uh, we're going to have to probably do something every year, at least for a while. We're going to probably see variants. In fact, we've got three more variants in Florida right now, just not as bad as the D variant hit all of us yet. Um, so we need to start looking about how we're going to move our programs along, um, you know, after we take a big breath, slow up, um, kind of reinitiate what our uh, intention was for some of our swing beds, because we all evolved differently uh, during the, the height of COVID, which would have been 2020. Um, so the other thing, um, this is a warning, and it actually surprised a lot of people that this language came out because it really doesn't say anything clearly, just enough to kind of make everybody raise their eyebrows. Um, and what this is, so if you see something like this from CMS, this isn't that we were using the waivers wrong necessarily. It is directed at about 10% of the population that always sort of pushes the rules too far in any setting, and we see this all the time. So the MACs are going to be looking at that. And I can tell you critical access hospitals do not tend to be the ones that fish, push those outer limits, uh, whether it's swing beds or any of the others. So what you see here is that they weren't following just the PHE and using the PHE because of COVID um, and the resulting impact on your communities because of COVID, but they were using it to increase the dollar amount that was coming into the nursing homes, basically skilled nursing facilities, um, 
by increasing the utilization and they couldn't tie it to anything. They weren't, they weren't literally tying it to any of the waivers. So when you see this warning, that's who they are after right now. And I suspect that's zero of you. Uh, again, I very, very rarely ever find any rural hospital that push this kind of limit. This tends to be in, on the nursing home side of the industry. I just want you to see that language in case it comes up more than once. And if you see something slightly different, have a question, you know, get in touch with Beck here and me, and we will try and translate it into English. The one thing that I am going to repeat that we've repeated pretty routinely through COVID-19 and will continue to repeat is you really, for any admission, you have to have medical necessity. So if we use the waiver where we could admit somebody, for instance, directly from the emergency room uh, during the height of the pandemic, um, to a swing bed, they still had to be medically necessary. We couldn't just put them there because they had nowhere else to go or because a doctor wanted them in a swing bed to watch them. They had to meet skilled rules. Um, and so we need to make sure, one, that you are following those rules, which I suspect you are. But the second warning on this is the only way you have to prove that you were meeting the medical necessity of a skill level um, admission is your documentation. And we certainly have spent a lot of time in the last I think Becky was at four or five months talking uh, almost exclusively about documentation. So it's a warning that you should be self auditing, not every chart if you don't feel like you need it, but looking through charts before they are closed uh, so that you can stand up to audits because you have your paperwork in place, um, which to me is an oxymoronic statement since we've been trying to take care of very sick people with less staff than normal and trying to do that on a, um, exceptional job and we're going to get dinged because of a piece of paper but it is there and we need to to uh, make sure we're filling out everything that we're supposed to all right so what i want to talk about when you get to that point in each of your communities where you can take a deep breath um, i would love to have you take a deep breath and look at your community as far as what the needs are swing beds are a good launching pad to a variety of services whether they are medical or non-medical in your community, mainly because we have more time. You know, if our average length of stay is 10 days or 14 days or 17 days, that's a lot better than 96 hours, um, you know, acute or even our outpatient services tend to be visit limited uh, or resource limited. So using swing beds as a way to build a community um, of resources for your population uh, is an amazing way to um, uh, keep people out of the hospital that don't need to be. So those are your unnecessary trips to ED and those are your unnecessary readmissions that CMS is certainly uh, centered in on. I also think as we slowly come out of this COVID, um, because we may have some minor setbacks here in the next year, uh, we do need to get back with our skilled nursing facilities, home health, assisted living, those types of uh, services in your community and just see if they have rearranged their admission types. In other words, after this, uh, we come out of whatever the COVID time period is, uh, do they intend to go back to whoever they were taking uh, in the past? Have they expanded the types of admissions they will uh, take and will that stay afterwards? But it's a time to kind of regather some information. It's also um, a reminder that we have to have a discharge plan involving the patient so having uh, patient education and list of resources uh, where we have the patient understanding what services are out there uh, to help somebody. And ultimately, you may be, want to be involved. I have more than one rural hospital um, that's working with, well, one of them is working with a church right now because the church had land and they have a, a garden um, that anybody can come in and, and take vegetables and fruit uh, from the garden, you know. So uh, there are ways to help your whole community, you don't have to do it, but we do need to have those list of resources. Patient education is really important. Uh, I will tell you, I was in the hospital for what, eight days, um, the um, last of February, 1st of March. And when um, the discharge planner came in my room, um, she said, well, here's some education for you. Here's this or that, and put the piece of paper down on the bedside table and left. Um, and I thought if this is the normal way to handle now, it was COVID. So remember, she wasn't gonna get next to me, but there was no, do you have questions? Do you understand what your limitations are gonna be? Do you need help with anything? Nothing. Uh, I suspect she was rushed, um, but it's not an excuse when I'm the head in the bed 
or Becky's the head in the bed or any of you are the head in the bed. It is really, really important. And that patient education um, is the one way we can assist people in understanding when they need pet- medical assistance and when they need social services. So things like uh, working with your therapy team to come up with home exercises um, and uh, maybe your nutrition team with easy to cook meals for the first 48 hours or a week, whatever they want to do, helps, again, everybody make the transition back from a, a swing bed stay or an acute stay back to real life. Um, medications are going to be uh, important going forward. We um, really do need to start uh, having an explanation with our medications. Uh, we need to start, I think, doing a med rec type of service while we have them in swing beds. These guys are on 12 and 14 and 18 medications, and there's no way they can take them correctly. So we need to be working with our uh, pharmacists. We need to be working with our PCPs uh, to try and, and um, figure out what we're going to do about medications going forward, uh, particularly with a population coming out of swing beds. Um, it is extraordinarily helpful if we have uh, a PCP visit or specialist visit arranged before they discharge from your swing bed program. Uh, I have, have a, an increasing number of communities that are using their rural health clinic as a primary uh, uh, physician if they don't have their own primary. So you might explore that if you have an RHC in your system or in your community. Um, and then the follow-up calls we've, we've discussed to try and stay in touch with people for that first 30 days. Um, and then ways, information, or services that are available for wellness, exercise, and nutrition. Those are things that we can do quietly, uh, do a little bit at a time, um, don't have to you know, sit with a whole committee and make decisions, but we should take stock on any changes that have occurred because I suspect there, there are some changes in all of our communities uh, as we go forward. Um, I, I have a couple of sheets here. I'm gonna, so you can read them uh, later. I'll go through them a little bit. There's two models beginning to come out of the pandemic that I think are both very valuable to small communities. One's paramedicine and the other one's the telehealth, telemedicine. We've heard more about telehealth and telemedicine. We've not heard as much, I don't think, you may have, um, of the paramedicine. So I have, what do I have here? Four examples here of how they're using um, EMTs paramedics um, for services other than what we traditionally would think paramedics are for. Um, so the first one's California, where they're focused on helping the uninsured Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is their Medicaid uh, program. Um, but the one that I appreciate is they've become the stopgap for home health. So when patients go home and home health isn't coming in for a day, two days, three days, whatever it might be, um, then they have a paramedicine program. Paramedics go by. Uh, whether it's to do blood checks, whether it's to check blood pressure, whether it's just to say, hello, did you settle into your home, make sure somebody hasn't fallen, all those things until home health can get in there. There is a West Virginia program, um, again, with um, paramedics doing follow-ups, uh, teaching about fall prevention. They will go in the home, see where there are fall risks, like drugs and stuff, and help people make changes. They can do blood draws, med rec, and um, I think that program, along with some others, they've been doing the vaccine for COVID. Uh, so that's another service. One in Virginia. Um, this one I really, really, really like. Um, they have a social worker um, that uh, is working with the paramedics, and they're doing home visits on the high utilizers of EDs. Um, and we know how big a number that is for most of our EDs. Um, and they're connecting them to social services. So they have permission in that setting um, to um, actually divert to um, a social setting, divert to a, a mental health choice, divert to other settings um, instead of going to the ED. Uh, and they've reduced their call volume by 60%, um, which is a, a pretty cool uh, program. And then Flagler County, which is just south of me here a little bit, um, they have, are looking at repeat users of ED. So they've enrolled 200 patients, uh, which the county uh, underwrites this program, and the paramedics do home safety inspections, education, uh, obviously vital signs, and they are administering the, the vaccine. All I'm saying is you do not have to follow a paramedicine model. For instance, some of you may own your um, EMRs, um, I mean, your uh, ambulance services, but 
and yet others you may have a working relationship with them. It's just interesting that we can be kind of wide open now and think outside of a box, literally, on what services will help us uh, get the right level of care to the right person. Uh, telehealth, I think you're very aware of telehealth, telemedicine. Uh, we do think when this interim rule comes out, we're going to see it continue to be part of the Medicare program. Uh, we don't know to what um, level yet. Uh, it has been used very, very successfully uh, during the pandemic across the country. Uh, these are some interesting ones if you want to look them up because they're different. They're telestroke, teleneurology, uh, a program that helps rural kidney patients get information quicker, and then the one on top uh, where they help with infusion oncology, and that's being uh, care provided by the critical access hospital uh, nursing staff there. So uh, again, nothing that you have to model exactly after this. You need to know what's going on in your own community, but uh, paramedicine and telehealth, I think, are ways for you to look beyond your hospital walls um, to get people, again, at the right level of care. And there's reimbursement for, obviously, both of these types of programs. So I think it's a time in the next month, at least till the end of the year, that we start looking about what's working for us and what's not. You know, transportation is always a huge issue. Pharmacy support is a huge issue. Um, do we have community centers, churches? Um, maybe your county health department, others that are helping with health and socialization. Uh, what are the clinics doing? Uh, do we have a group in our communities that are building ramps or widening bathroom door frames? Um, do we have food banks, gardens, delivery of food? Those are kind of the, the core level of services that help people stay out of unnecessary uh, health care visits. So that's what I'm preaching this month, Becky. Uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Actually, Carrie, at this I have time, other yeah. I was going to say. I just have to, other information for them. Yeah. Um, you might address a question that we recently had from our last call regarding uh, long-term care and vaccinations. And um, right. Go ahead. So I spent yeah I spent some time this month looking into it because there is no clear-cut answer. And um, Becky will tell you because of prior calls. I've had, I think it's at least four questions that are in, have been sent to CMS, two of them repeatedly, um, and we're not getting answers right now. That's another reason I think the interim rules coming out, they're tied up with that. Um, so uh, I can uh, query them and I will, but there's no straight answer on it. So I think um, that I would follow. So in this case, the question came from a facility where I think a state person surveyor came in and said, you know, following the Acute rules is fine. Uh, other places, they are saying that you need to follow the long-term care rules. I think you need to do what's in your best judgment for each of your facilities. Uh, but I think the most important thing that you need to do at this point is number one, do the testing, whichever format. And number two, what does your um, policy say? Because they will go directly to your policy and you need to be following your policy, whichever way you go. And with that, that Becky, um, I'm wondering if it's worth opening the chat pane a little bit and asking people what they are doing and what they are following in their own hospital system in Indiana. That makes sense? Yeah, definitely chat in what you're, um, you're doing, we will share. And um, any other questions you have related to it? And also, Carrie, while um, people are chatting in what they're doing, um, we had a question in the past too, and I wanted the group to know that you know we hadn't forgotten about it. Was about um, reimbursement for patients that were uh, requiring cardiac rehab while they yeah. were uh, in yeah. the swing bed area. So just I didn't know if you wanted to provide any kind of update yeah. there. That's one of the four. <laughs> that is sitting at CMS and has been sitting there since that first request. Um, traditionally, cardiac rehab has not been covered under skilled care, um, traditionally. I, I don't know how they'll translate it at this point. Um, if they are going out for cardiac rehab, in other words, you are not providing it uh, from your own service, um, then at a minimum, uh, I suspect it uh, could be included on a claim because we're supposed to put on the claim any service provided to a patient while they're in a swing bed uh, if you're critical access. 
Um, but I don't have proof of that. Um, and I have not heard anything back from, and again, that's something that where I have asked uh, the other consultants I work with across the country and it has not come up uh, from any other area. So we really don't even have a hint on it. So please know that it isn't dropped off the list. It's just sitting out there uh, waiting for somebody to put something in writing or give me a call or whatever they will do um, so that we can do some direction on it. I, I will say it's not traditionally been an area of covered. Uh, under uh, under skilled nursing. So that's the only basis I can tell you at this point. I did have a question just emailed to me. Um, we are okay. taking care of sicker patients in our swing bed units. Do you have some innovative activities for these sick patients um, that are helpful? <laughs> that's that's a good uh, question. A brilliant question. It is brilliant. And I'm so happy to hear that as tired as everybody is and as sick as all your patients have been that you're, you're asking it. What I'd like to do, Becky, is I'm actually working on a list. Um, I'm actually Perfect. using it as a speaking topic next week. Um, so what I'd like to do is send the list that I have, which is very short. And then I'm hoping next week, because I have about 400 people signed up for that, uh, presentation um, that I will hear some brilliant ideas from people. Uh, I love it when we get a big room full of people because there's always at least a couple creative ideas in there. But I will send you what I have right now. And then following that, I will send an update. And whoever's asking that question, thank you very much. Um, yeah, they are sicker, but they still need to be engaged in wanting to live and, uh, and wanting to heal. And that comes from using their mind, um, maybe their spirit about things that are important to them. So um, my, my hint is uh, when we are doing our, I, most of you would be in your nursing assessment, but it doesn't have to be. When we're doing our activities assessment, we really need an open-ended question in that, not just our checkbox uh, questions, which is if they don't know that patient, you know, what's important to them? Um, because there are ways we can find TV channels or get visitors to come by, all sorts of things, um, you know, while they're in there to at least talk about things that they're interested. Um, I think I've already told you the, the Western Channel story, so I won't repeat it, but it was an eye opener that that, uh, that uh, gentleman, all he wanted to do was watch the Western Channel on TV. I, had, I didn't even know there was one. I had to go find it for him because um, there was like 380 channels to choose from, so it took us a while. But, you know, some people aren't capable of asking um, for, you know, a Western channel or a particular, you know, game show in the morning or, you know, watching Lifetime channel or whatever. So um, that's, the, that's the quickest fix has, has tended to be, you know, television. Um, and then depending on where you are with volunteers these days, um, you know, whether it's ministers uh, making calls or literally coming bedside again. Uh, whether it is um, neighbors or small groups that uh, come in and will visit patients, um, and we're allowing that again in your, each of your hospitals, uh, those that contact with human beings and something you know that they're interested in about living in life um, really is the, the best medicine. Thank you. So I, I will turn this too. If anybody's got a great idea, I'd love to hear it. Uh, for any of this, whether they're extraordinarily ill or things yes. that you are finding or just working with swing bed patients. Um, because it is a shorter stay and we've got to uh, figure out how to work it in time-wise and to figure out how to offer them what they need. And we have a variety of patients coming through the door. Yes, definitely. If you have innovative ideas, why certainly share that in chat as well. Um, we did have some people respond here in chat. Let me get it pulled up here better. Um, have a hospital that is mandating vaccines for all healthcare systems employees by November 1st. Okay. We. All right, so can I ask a question that Becky? So that's employees yeah. by November 1st. Is that gonna include patients then? And that's a separate question actually. It's not of the same regs, but just check, have them check. Okay, and we are in, uh, another hospital is encouraging vaccines, but have not mandated it at this time. And then okay. another hospital, all associates must be fully vaccinated on or before November the 12th. And again, okay. same questions. Yep. Um, question from 
Um, Jill Bailey and others, please chime in too. Does anyone have volunteers in their hospitals now? Uh, currently, uh, Green does not. And why are they putting that? Go ahead. ahead. No, I was going to say, <laughs> Carrie, if you have any suggestions on that too regarding um, volunteers. It is, really, it is going area by area. Um, so, for instance, Florida, where we have we really had the D variant full blown, um, we have not had volunteers uh, near our programs, and a lot of the outpatient services were even limited uh, during that time period. Um, but I do have um, some clients, uh, one hospital in Utah, um, and one in South Dakota that uh, have continued to use volunteers, uh, not in the first six or seven months of the COVID uh, mess. But certainly after that, they, they uh, re-engaged volunteers for specific projects. Um, they, have, um, they, they both have different sets of rules, so I don't think there's one way to do it. Most of them just um, keep distance in the room. They're closer to the door than they are to the patient, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And if they need to bring things in, then the nursing staff is bringing them in um, and introducing them directly to the patient because they're gowned, um, et cetera. So the safety is being... Um, recognized. Uh, visits, you know, uh, whether it's telephone or whatever, visits are huge, trying to keep people connected um, socially, particularly if they're worried about a spouse or children or whoever else that, that might be at home. So um, uh, if we can use volunteers for anything, that's great, but it's going to really depend on what's going on in your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. Okay, have some good suggestions here. Um, Crystal shared that for their activities, they went to Dollar Tree and bought games for the patients, magnetic checkers, tic-tac-toe, connect four, four to play with staff or family. There is also a way to purchase items that patients can keep because they are so affordable. That's a good idea. Right. Uh, we also make good. quiet kits such as eye mask, earbuds, noise machines, relaxation, music, et cetera and schedule them for 15 minutes of rest time as an activity for the weaker or ill patients. Very nice. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that one actually in a couple of years. We had quiet kits for a while, so I'm glad somebody's doing that. It's a great option. Yeah. Looks so like- can, they, can I ask them what they're doing for the, the noise? What, what are they doing with that? What, what are they using to um, kind of quiet the space around them? And Crystal, you're welcome to unmute if it's easier for you to respond. Okay, we have actual like noise machines that emit white noise. And then we have some of them okay. that emit um, uh, like sounds of nature. And then we have relaxation CDs. So it just depends. And then they have the mm -hmm. option, okay. we give them the earbuds too. We buy those at the Dollar Tree because they're a dollar a pair. That way, if, they, if someone does have a roommate, they can listen quietly. Okay, and is this equipment that then the staff is handling the equipment and putting in the CD or whatever else so the patient's not handling any of the equipment? Is that right, Crystal? That's correct. The staff is the one handling it. And all the yeah. equipment too is kind of checked off. Um, that's not single patient use, that's checked off. You know, we clean everything between patient use and it's right. checked off by our um, clinical um, team. Uh, for safety, that checking the cords and things like that annually, our trimedics group. Right, perfect. I have not heard the noise machine. I'm glad to hear that. The quiet kits, we had sort of a rush on that maybe three or four years ago. Where everybody thought it was a cool idea. And then it, I don't, I mean, I remember talking about it. I remember seeing it in different um, sites that I was visiting at that time. And then I haven't heard much. So I'm, I'm glad to be reminded of that because that's a perfect um, thing for any swing bed, actually any hospital patient period, um, just to, you know, hospital rooms don't tend to be very dark. So, you know, having the eye mask and that sort of, you know, earplugs, all that's great for somebody trying to rest. Good idea, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. I love the next one too. It's from Anne. She says that pet visitations make a difference yeah. for some swing bed patients. Yes. Stephanie did respond to your question earlier about do you mandate vaccines for patients? And uh, no, they're currently not mandating 
uh, patients for okay. Union Health. So that to okay. kind of respond to that. Um, looks like there are some volunteers back, um, yet not. Um, Della is sharing that not as many are comfortable with COVID, but they are allowed um, okay. and indicated that they have not brought back back, um, back the volunteers. So that's kind of um, very hospital dependent, not really seeing a big balance of one way or the other. Um, Stephanie shared that their chaplain was making rounds, uh, but it is no longer available. The volunteers are reluctant to come back to any bedside engagement at this time, and understandably so. Uh, Crystal said that they're limiting volunteers with registration in some of the medical areas. Jill is sharing that they have a cabinet of activities and that she goes to the library and gets books that they give to her uh, for use. Um, uh, what goes into the room, the patient takes home then. They also have games, painting, magazines, knitting, et cetera. And if they want something that the hospital doesn't have, she does have some money from a local church uh, to get some things for them. Good idea with a church connection or any, yeah. any outside group providing funds. Yeah. Well, I'm, first of all, I think it's super that so many of you can answer those kind of questions immediately because it's very easy when we've got very sick patients very limited staff we're all been working you know many many hours that we're still stopping to think about this sort of thing and i think whether you see that it makes a difference or not it makes a difference for that human being when they go home i can guarantee it because you're talking to someone that sort of has lived in a hospital for the last four or five years right. so i know what it feels like when somebody even comes in and smiles which is hard through a mask these days but talks to you you know, on a more personal level, it makes all the difference uh, in the rule. Yeah. Another point that Andrea shared, um, and, and please everyone open up chat and look at everyone's comments, but they also require all contractors must have proof of vaccination as well. We do have options for uh, declining for medical or religious reasons. And then um, Jill has also shared that she's very fortunate as a social worker. Um, she can go into a room at her discretion to provide support services for COVID patients. And they have formalized quiet areas uh, from one to three and they are announced. And at that particular time, staff have fewer contacts in the rooms and they have earbuds and use mu music through an iPad. So some, some oh, great cool. strategies shared today. Yep. Well, what I'll try and do is add these to the list. So I'll, I'll, I think I'll just wait maybe Becky to send the list out until after next week because we're probably going to get more. I'll add okay. these ideas, uh, add the other ones, and then I'll send you that complete list. Um, some of it you will expect. What's funny is when I was putting it together, uh, it's just like thinking about the quiet kids. I've used them in the past and have forgotten about them. So sometimes we just need a slight reminder of something that has worked in the past that might be very appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what's going on in your area. I know in Florida, we're, we're suspecting that at least not only just the end of this year, but through the spring here, that we're still gonna have to be very, very careful. So that means what we're talking mm -hmm. about now, we can continue probably six to 12 months very easily, uh, how we're gonna provide activities you know, without volunteers, provide a variety of things. So any ideas are great. These are these are wonderful suggestions. So thank you. Yes, thanks everyone for sharing. Okay, you can proceed now, I think, Carrie. All right, so um, I have put a couple of things here when you are looking towards your community. Uh, I suspect all of you have done this in some portion. You may have even been doing more of it pre-COVID and COVID, you know, redirected this obviously for at least 13 months. Uh, so it's a reminder again, um, looking at coordination with other healthcare entities. As I, I said, prior to COVID, but certainly during COVID, um, the PCPs being used in the rural health clinics were helping keeping people out of the ED uh, on unnecessary approaches. So uh, healthcare approach, uh, community access, in other words, what we're doing uh, to reduce, for instance, duplication of services. Uh, I know we're sometimes in competitive situations because we're a different business entity. 
But the fact is most smaller communities, we can work out those differences so that we're getting people to the right setting. And then any education, um, I, 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 we can talk about social determinants of health. Those are big words for people that live in a small community. You know, what does that mean to them? It means that we have a certain percentage of your communities that are aging. Uh, so do we have a, a council on aging? Is the uh, county health department doing things? Are the churches having luncheons for older uh, people? Again, as we evolve out of um, COVID, we want to make sure that we're addressing it. Uh, tracking what you're doing will remain important, particularly in the way I think the federal government is going. Um, so being able to, first of all, for you to be able to tell the story of the things that you are doing, um, some of these ideas that you just suggested to me, I don't, I don't want to call it an advertisement, but you know, when you are highlighting what your hospital is doing, talking about some of these activity ideas will open people's eyes because it will make um, are, are frightened by what's going on. So uh, use that sort of information. Um, knowing what your community access is for people, again, what your working relations are, relationships are, other resources that are coming in or evolving will be important. Um, we, when we have something, and I will say I'm not sure I've lived something exactly like COVID, but we certainly lived through epidemics in this country before and we've, we've evolved you know, as healthcare workers and healthcare entities. So we'll see what's going on. Education is huge where they can get information. And remember, there's printed information from um, American Heart Association, the Alzheimer's Association. There are things that can be downloaded for them. You can provide them with the website uh, or you can provide them with some actual hands-on materials. So uh, we've got resources that we can be using um, and tracking who we are providing that information to. And then the support services, you got Becky right there at State Office of Rural Health. Uh, I mean, they've got tons of information, but don't forget your technical schools and your colleges. Um, we have college, like I, um, I have, uh, what is it? I think 67 hospitals in Georgia and the uh, technical schools in Georgia have been um, sending over all sorts of um, people, supplies, odds and ends during this COVID um, emergency. So they were manning things where that wasn't patient contact so that those that were licensed could do the patient contact when we had shortages of staff. So just remember this is a um, community-wide, statewide, nationwide, um, obviously by the word pandemic, uh, worldwide uh, issue that we're all having to live through. And there, there are support services out there. Um, often you in the hospital are the ones providing it, but just remember others may be able to help you and uh, kind of think outside the box like you are doing with the activities. So that's really it, um, you know, unless there are other questions or comments. Um, and I hope I'm not, I just want to make sure I'm not saying that you're having to go open the doors and start rerunning programs tomorrow or next week or even next month. It's just time to start thinking about what's our evolution going to be as we try and get back closer to normal. One chat that um, I will share is um, Stephanie shared that they are requiring their medical staff in, in addition to their contract staff and volunteer groups uh, to be vaccinated too. So just a little thought yeah, there. Yeah, I to... And that's something everybody can check. I, I actually have two hospitals where we have a physician and each of them is refusing to be vaccinated. Um, and it's causing quite a stir for those hospitals. So. Um, if for all the reasons that you can figure out. So you just um, need to make sure that that's being addressed locally in, in your setting. And that can be specialists, remember. You, you know, your people could be going out, you know, to a larger city uh, for heart or pulmonary or whatever. So make sure whatever your rules are, um, you're, you're clear. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure your administration is thinking of that ahead of time. But I've been, I've been sort of surprised by physicians not getting uh, vaccinated. Carrie, another uh, question that was chatted to me, could you review again when the waivers will expire? Yes, and this is our best guess at this point. Um, they have to give us um, lead time, at least 60 days lead time. Uh, we have thought that, um, I think it has to be, I can't remember what month anymore now, 
it's so funny. But anyway, it has to be re-signed here towards the end of the year uh, to have the um, public um, health continue, the emergency continue. Um, so we don't know if they're going to re-sign it. We don't know re if they're going to re-sign parts of it. My best guess is they're going to start letting some of the waivers drop um, and they will announce those towards the end of the years, but then end of the year, but then you'll have 60 days to adjust to it. It isn't like one, we have so many CMS rules that they send something out and say, you know, it's going to, you're going to get the notice on October 31st and they're going to change the rule on November 1st. So you actually have no time to adjust the waivers, the, the, um, the law states that they have to give 60 days. So, um, we expect the end of the year. Um, I would be looking at the waivers you're using if they are helping you with your patient base, continue to use them until we get the definitive answer. If you're really not using them that much, I would start weaning off of them. Uh, it'll just be easier when we get in that 60 day period to know what you have to control and what you might have to change to take care of people. Does that make sense, Becky? Yes, yes. That was a good question too. We all get very uh, used to certain ways of doing things and then um, things change and catch us a little bit off guard. So that's all the questions I have for today and we are out of time. Again, Carrie and I are available to address your questions um, as they come along and thank you for your time. Thank you for everything that you do every day. Um, tremendous work being done out there in rural communities, and we're very grateful for that. I want to thank Allie Orwig for supporting Zoom for us today, and also to David Conrad and Joyce Fillenworth at the State Office of Rural Health for all the extra uh, support that they've provided during the uh, pandemic as well. So everyone take care, and uh, we will be in touch. So today's session was recorded. So if individuals were unable to attend from your hospital, feel free to share the recording with them. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.